congratulations on Anchorman 2. It is much, much funnier than the first film. And while the first film was a parody, this is a genuine satire. <laughs> Well, I would argue the first one had some satire going on as well. I mean, you know, Panda Watch Day 29 and, you know, talking about Anchorman's hair and stuff. But you're right. I think this one, guys, the teeth are a little sharper on the second one. There's no doubt. And what prompted that shift, Adam? Well, unfortunately, reality. Uh, you know, since we made the first one, the news has just gotten so ridiculous and so off the rails that to pull back and do a soft approach just wouldn't make any sense. Um, so, yeah, we kind of had to, and especially when you're getting into 24-hour news and that whole era of cable television, it, it demands that kind of approach. So, uh, And fortunately, it's also funny, so uh, that was the good news. You certainly make some very valid points about the nature of news, and it was while watching this and while seeing that it's inevitable that you're going to make an Anchorman 3, I'm wondering whether you and your team are a little creatively frustrated in that you can't bring these characters to where they need to be, which is now. <laughs> you are correct. That is a, a smart point slash question. Yeah, it's true. I mean, they really need to at least be in, you know, 2004 or, you know, 98. Uh, you know, I was, when the reporters started getting embedded, uh, when you're seeing, like, this kind of infotainment that's everywhere, yeah, it's true. I mean, maybe we will. Maybe we'll just say the hell with it and we'll do really bad prosthetics. Although we're not positive we're doing a third one. We'll see how this one does first. I understand that uh, making this film was... A lot of hurdle jumping in this. You put together proposals, you got turned down, you really had to fight to get it made. Can you, firstly, just give us a very quick summary of the trouble you had getting this made and tell us honestly if you expected an easier ride or whether it's just a rough and tumble of making films in Hollywood. Well, you know, the first six years that we didn't make the sequel, that was Will and I choosing not to. We, we just wanted to do original movies. We didn't feel like, why, why should we ever do a sequel to anything? And then we just got worn down by the fans, kept asking us and asking us, until finally we took a beat and just said, huh, could you do a good sequel? And the second we had the 24-hour news idea, we realized, oh, absolutely. In fact, this could even be more exciting. So, and then, yeah, we went to the studio, and we had a budget level we wanted, and they felt like it was too high, and we felt like it was just right. And that, and that's kind of just regular rough and tumble making movies in a studio system. It wasn't anything personal. You know, it was frustrating because we did feel like, oh, my God, we're finally going to do the sequel. Let's go. And then we realized, like, nope, that's not how it's going to work. So what ended up happening was kind of what needed to happen, which is we found a much more moderate budget level. Uh, it made all of us hungrier to do it. And then from the second it was greenlit, uh, it was nothing but a pleasure. Uh, Paramount was amazing, and Adam Goodman specifically was just a, a real pleasure to work with, and they've been incredible. So, yeah, it, it's one of those things. I've, I've had it happen a million times where you go in expecting one thing and something else happens. It's just the way it happens with, with making movies. Did you and the guys take pay cuts to make this film? We did, yeah. yeah. We took pretty sizable ones, like 60%. Congratulations on having the balls to do that. <laughs> And, you know, we've really been primed up to do it. We just, at that point, were like, let's go make this movie. Let's do it any way we can. And, you know, fortunately, we live in a demented enough world where people who make movies like this get paid enough anyway that even with a 60% cut, we're still doing quite well. So we can't complain. Is the appeal of Anchorman, and I believe with Anchorman 2, or that the parody and the satire really does speak to the new century cynicism that people have about media? I, I think it's it's two things. I think absolutely it, it speaks to that cynicism that people have about media. There's no doubt about it. But I think it goes beyond that. I think it's just the cynicism people have towards power now, uh, because that's what Ron Burgundy kind of represents. He represents like a you know a stuff shirt kind of guy with nothing to back it up other than the fact that he got this position and he's there and he thinks he's better than you and. I think that goes across the board, whether you're talking about 
new media, whether you're talking about presidential candidates, whether you're talking about corporate CEOs who have crazy parties with ice sculptures and waste money and don't really do anything. And uh, there's just a lot of empty, entitled power in the world. And as grim as that sounds, it's also really, really funny. And, and that's something I think Will and I both enjoy. Now, I know that you, like Judd Apatow, like Adam Sandler, like a lot of big comedy filmmakers, like to have your guys improv on camera. Now, this is something that we normally associate with new generation filmmaking, but in fact, Charlie Chaplin used to rehearse on film. Can you explain, Adam, just what the benefit is of having you guys improv while the camera's rolling rather than rehearsing something that you know works and then going with that? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, the Marx Brothers used to take their movies on the road. They would tour them as live shows and constantly tweak them and get them timed for an audience, and then they would go shoot them. Uh, I think what we're doing is a little bit the reverse of that. We're, you know, writing the script, rewriting the script, getting on, getting in front of the camera and improvising, improvising, then we're taking the movie out to audiences, and I'm showing it to them, and I'm putting in different jokes, and I'm timing it differently. So it's kind of a reverse version of that. You're absolutely right. It's not the newest idea in the world, but for some reason it went away for a while with filmmaking, and I think partially because of the Avid, as opposed to the old you know cam way of editing by hand, I think the Avid really allowed for this method to come back. Um, I can't imagine doing a comedy any other way. I mean, my whole background's improvisation, and that's what I've always done, so uh, it's very natural to me. So just in parentheses, it's a digital-enabled kind of facility that you now have. The digital does make that much more easier and better to do. Yeah, I think the reason there was an explosion in great comedies about, what, 10, 15 years ago was because of the Avid. I think the amount of precise cutting you do with comedies to really get them timed correctly and to really get that pacing right, you couldn't have done with the by-hand method of editing. Uh, now, not to say, uh, that's not true. It can be done. It was just much more difficult. I mean, you look at a movie like Airplane, although those guys came from a live theater background, too. I think that played into it. But yeah, I think the Avid is the reason that we've just seen so many good comedies. When I was younger, there would be a good comedy every like three or four years. That was it. And I feel like now there's like two or three every year that really make me laugh. Now, mate, you did not get the award that you deserved for Anchorman and in making an entire feature film out of the footage that you cut out after the early test screenings. <laughs> mate, that's obviously a testament to the brutality of the test screening process. Can you just give us just a, a little characterization about how tough and how demanding that test preview process is for a filmmaker like you. I got to tell you, I love it. I mean, it's it, without it, I uh, I can't imagine. I mean, I can't imagine, but I I want to test more and more. Uh, every time I test screen, I learn more about the movie. I get to see what it's doing. Comedy is a genre built upon an interaction with an audience. Uh, I like that interaction to be a little subversive and surprising and absurd, but without seeing that interaction happen, I, I don't think you can really ever get to the meat of what you're trying to do. So I, I love the test screening process. Now, there are cases, I, I'm very lucky as a director in the sense that the studio doesn't look over my shoulder too much. I think some people, newer filmmakers, that test making process can't, that test screening process can be brutal where it allows the studio to second guess you, but I, you know, knock on wood, have been lucky enough not to go through it. So for me, it's all a positive. Funny or die, it's one of the best online comedy side. What is it about Funny and I that pleases you the most? I, you know, I love the fact that we're just meeting all these young filmmakers and writers and actors from all around the country that, you know, in years past, you, you either had to go to New York or L.A. or maybe Chicago to ever get seen, and now because of the Internet, you're just hearing all these voices, seeing all these different people from all around the world. Uh, I just think it's amazing, and we've we found talented directors and writers and actors from it. Um, that to me is the coolest thing. Also, having a company with like you know 100 employees and there are people in, who are 24, 25, six years old, who are a lot like us, who are able to get a paycheck and healthcare and like to be able to support like you know basically our broke 20 year old selves is pretty exciting. Okay, here's a question I've, I've been dying to ask ever since I saw the film: Talladega Nights. Whose genius idea was it to insert a beer commercial in the middle of a car prank? <laughs> uh, want to hear the craziest thing? Here's whose idea that was. NASCARs. We were looking at the crash. It was too long, and this woman, Sarah Nettinger,
manager from NASCAR said, why don't you play a commercial in the middle of the crash, kind of half joking. And I said, oh, my God, we're doing that. So we put a commercial right in the middle of the crash. So it was the strangest way that came about, but I always thank her. It was the best idea. Step on this tune. Is it going to be a sequel? You know, probably not anytime soon, just because we did this sequel, and I don't want to get in the business of doing tons of sequels. It can get a little boring. So, you know, well, I'd never say never, but it would be a little ways from now. I'll tell you for sure, though, we want to do more movies with Will and John C. Riley. I feel like they're a great, great comedy team, so you will be seeing more of them. And with the DVD of Anchorman 2 have an, an alternate cut with all uh, the improvised lines that you had to cut out for this version put in? It will, yeah. Eventually there will be a version of the movie with all new jokes. Every single joke replaced with an improv all. I don't think it's ever been done before, but yeah, we're, we're in the middle of cutting it right now. Christina Applegate, the hardest thing in comedy has got to be being the straight person. She's amazing. She's the best. I mean, she's both the straight person and hilariously funny at the same time. Yeah, she laughs sometimes, but, you know, she's a consummate pro and tough as nails and can handle those guys. Uh, this movie, even more than the first one, just made me appreciate how fantastic she is.